Good morning. My name is Lisa Gruber and I work at Legacy Church. Welcome. We are going to lift our praises and tell God just how grateful we are that He is our God, that He is our rock, our fortress and strength. We're going to do this through the singing of our songs today that come straight from Scripture, through the hearing and the taking in of the message from Psalm 119, and through the giving of our gifts and our resources back to God out of our grateful hearts. Why don't you go to our webpage found at www.legacysd dot org slash connect and let us know of any of the concerns or needs you have. Prayer requests would be taken from that point as well and given to our prayer teams who pray for you each and every day. If you'd like to give online, go to the front page of our web and you can hit the Give Now button and give right there very privately and we would be glad for you to do so. Thank you. For joining us today. I'm going to lift my voice with yours today in worship to my God. I'm so excited to introduce you to Jessica Hastings, the La Mesa Children's Director, who has something special from her heart today. God bless. And I'm thirsty for you In a dry land with no dream I need you Inside this heart of stone So turn it into flesh 
the spirit softening I give you all I have I'm holding nothing back Jesus I am yours Jesus I am yours Take
Legacy Church. Uh, Jessica here, your children's director at the La Mesa campus. And um, I'm excited that I get to talk a little bit about uh, what verse has really struck me and struck my heart uh, from Psalm 119 this month as we are digging through um, that psalm. And um, that verse is actually a few verses. Uh, reading from the NLT version, starting with verse 91. It says, Your laws remain true today, for everything serves your plans. If your law hadn't sustained me with joy, I would have died in misery. I will never forget your commandments, for you have used them to restore my joy and health. I am yours. Save me. You know, I think in a time like right now where there's so much uncertainty, there are so many changes. Um, if you're like me, I um, I don't always love change. I know it's good, but um, uh, this, this verse just really is important to me um, in a time when, not just right now, but even before quarantine, when um, I was going through a lot of really hard things and um, uh, some hard things with change and um, and friendships and um, different relationships. And um, change is sometimes a really good thing, but it's not very easy. And um, I just, the one thing that has sustained me through all of that is just that the Lord is faithful to me, that, um, that he gives me joy. He sustains me with joy. I don't have to die in misery in my misery and um, to not forget his commandments, not forget the words that he has put on my heart that restores my joy and my health. And the, my favorite part, um, Psalm 119, 94, I am yours, save me. And uh, just how beautiful that is that I am his, you are his. And, um, he loves you so much. He loves us and um, he will be the one to save us. He has uh, saved us by giving his son um, to, uh, to forgive us of our sins. And so uh, what an ultimate sacrifice um, and ultimate gift for us. And that's just really what's been touching my heart this time. And uh, I hope that that's a blessing to you. Uh, good to see you all and uh, take care. Hello, Legacy Online family. Uh, welcome to church, uh, wherever you are right now. We are so happy you are with us together as we dive further into Psalm 119. And I just have a confession to make right at the start of, of our conversation today. And it's the fact that I don't really believe that altruism exists. Altruism is the idea that we do things purely from a disinterested or selfless place and doing good unto others. I can't help but believe that you and I, okay, maybe it's, maybe it's not you, maybe it's just me, but I feel like I always have in the back of my mind what's in it for me. I just, I just do. That's, that's who I am. That's, that's what I experience. And, and I look at Scripture and I don't necessarily think that that is a terrible thing in and of itself. And, and the reason is, is that God, in His conversation with us throughout all of the Bible, uh, he's regularly telling us things like uh, trust in the Lord and, and you will delight yourself in him or in his right hand are pleasures forevermore. There is joy in his presence that, that he came to give us full and abundant life. Uh, there's all these promises that appeal to our emotions, our desires, things that we long for, peace and comfort and safety and love and value. And so I think when it comes to our relationship with God, I, I think it's okay for us to recognize that, that you and I have been made by God to delight in God. And what we see 
in, in this section of Psalm 119, starting in verse 97. Uh, and we've been in this series called Summer Psalms in, in just the chapter, Psalm 119. And we've been breaking it down. And, and we've been in it for a while. And Pastor Todd has done a great job leading us through it. And, and what we're going to discover together in this section is that we have an invitation to move from dormant to devotion. Uh, we get to move from dormancy to, to a dormant state uh, like butterflies go into when they're still caterpillars turning into butterflies. It's a dormant state. We get to go from a dormant state into devotion. And that's done primarily by looking at the benefits that come from God's Word. And in case you have never been in Psalm 119 before, welcome. It is all about God's Word. You'll see words all over it, commands, decrees, laws, precepts, all over it. And it's just this individual's expression, creative expression of their delight in this book, in this word. And so I, I want to um, recognize the fact that we are invited by God into a place where we delight in the law of God and what happens when we get into God's law is that there is absolutely no way that we can stay dormant, right? There's no way that we can stay in the place that we've been. I think you and I have a lot of familiarity with a dormant state in the middle of COVID, right? I mean, initially it's like, okay, I wake up at 11 a.m. and think, man, I better get out of bed or I'm going to be late for the couch, right? I mean, there's not a lot going on. We seem to be in hibernation. But here's the thing. If we enter into God's word, uh, the reality is, is we, a lot might not change right now. We might still be in quarantine. We might still have a job or be working remotely or not have a job. But the transformation that's going to happen will be exponential uh, to, to a dormant state that we were in. Because here's the thing, and I'll just tell you right now, I'll tell you right now, if, if you want to stay dormant, stay out of God's word. If you want to stay dormant, if you are not interested in growing, in, in, uh, in advancing in character and integrity and, and all of these other things, then, then stay out of God's word. However, as I mentioned, I, I think that God entices us and speaks to our deepest desires with the transformation that happens when we get into God's word, that we do see greater um, levels of peace and comfort, greater levels of joy and connection with other people, and tenderness and compassion as we see all of those things in our God. And so that's the benefit that we see from Scripture, and that is the, uh, the transformation. And in case you don't know, here at Legacy, we have core values, and one of our core values is transformation. And the phrase we love to, to say with that is supernatural change. Supernatural change. Uh, and that happens through this word. And so we're going to see, uh, we're going to see that, that there is transformation and the types of transformation that the word causes that breaks up into two parts in verses 97 to 104. We see what it's like uh, for this psalmist from then to now, from then to now. It's really difficult to see a transformation process in the day to day, isn't it? Right. You think of a weight loss transformation or restoring an old car or something. You really see the difference in the before and after photo. So it's important for us to spend time uh, sitting down and reflecting on where we've come from uh, back then and where we are now. And then in verses 105 to 112, we see from now until then. We set our sights on the future. We uh, enter into hope and have an eye towards where we're headed. So that is what we're going to see. And um, one, one last caveat before, we're just really going to break this down and have a little Bible study together. But one, one last thing I want to say is that in this conversation, the, the greatest thing that I want for you um, is to get into the Word more, uh, to, to get into the Bible more. And that's not because I want you to be checking boxes in your faith. It's because by getting into this, you are getting into the presence of God. You are absolutely getting into the presence of the one who made you and loves you more than you could ever dream or imagine. And uh, the, the last thing I want you to do, if the greatest thing I want you to do is to get in the word more, the last thing I want you to do is to try harder. 
Because what you're going to see is if you get into the word more and you spend time in the presence of the one that this reveals to us, then we're going to see that trying harder is the exact opposite of what our faith is about. It's about believing. Um, It's about um, putting our faith in God to do the heavy heavy lifting and just making ourselves available to him by spending time in this word. So what we want to see um, through this process is, is that fixation can cause transformation. Like fixation on God, it will absolutely cause transformation. And so the, the types we see from then to now, starting in verse 97, this is what scripture says. And, and what we're going to see first is we're going to see positive external comparison as a type of transformation caused by the word. Oh, how I love your law, verse 97 says. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. Um, Now, initially, when I first read this, I felt like it was a little bit braggy, right? You know, like Moses writing, and Moses was the most humble man in all the earth, right? He actually wrote that. And that's what this felt like initially, but... I, the more time I spent with it, the, the less I thought this, this author was being brag, bragging like crazy or that he was trying to put others down to make himself look better. And I, I think that he's profoundly baffled. Like he can't believe where he's come from and where he is now. And, and one of the only ways that we can tell the difference between two things is comparison, right? Um, Wyatt thinks everything. My son Wyatt, he's an 18-month-old and he thinks every thing larger than a car is a bus like everything's a bus but that's not true and we have to compare and contrast and see the difference between things and so that's what he's doing here and and here's the thing i think uh, there's very few people in the world who when they achieve a level of excellence in something they are not baffled and rightly so Uh, think about it lebron james is is not baffled when he hits the clutch three-pointer or scores 40 or 50 or 60 points in a game and we're really not baffled either. Um, But the rest of the world, (laughs) we would be really baffled if I ever did that on a professional basketball court. You see, the thing is God uses ordinary people to show off his extraordinary transforming power. He uses ordinary people like you and me. And I think this psalmist as well, I think we look at the Bible and think, wow, these people were so uh, much on a higher level than me in their spirituality. But God wrote a book full of failures and flawed people and broken storylines to show off his extraordinary transforming power. And so I think one of the ways that the word is is going to transform us and or we're going to see the transformation it causes us is by positive external comparison. So this is an opportunity for, for us to look back. How have you learned? How have you grown? How have you excelled beyond where you were or others were or thought you could ever be, especially when it comes to the word. And if you've never taken God at his word and really let it soak in and and fall in love with the God who loves you, naturally pouring out of that the things that you see in him, which you're going to see in scriptures as well, I, I want to challenge you to start doing that. To, to jump in. Now, Psalm 119 is a great place. I would also recommend starting maybe in the book of John. Just start reading through and see who Jesus is and how you start looking more and more like him as you look at his life. The, the next way that we see transformation that's caused by the word is obvious fruit. Uh, this is what it says in, in verse 101 and 102. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws for you yourself have taught me. Okay, so what we look at here is, is an outward expression of, of the life transformation that the psalmist has experienced. Listen, I've kept my feet from every evil path, right? I could have gone this way or that, but you know what? I stayed on track. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. Really, what he's appealing to is his track record, right? Uh, if, if you're going to go and buy a house, uh, you want to pick someone who has a great track record of getting the, the best deals for their clients and, and for making sure that uh, houses are closing their deals and it's not falling through escrow and there aren't things that are missed. You want someone who you can trust. There's a track record. And what's, what's important about a track record is, is actually 
the, the fact that the phrase track record was initially used either on, and they're not sure, but either on a horse track or like track and field. And it's the record of that track. And, and the way you get a record, the way that you have your name written down in history that's worth noting is, is that you abide by the boundaries of the track, right? You don't run all over the place. There are expectations of you that you would do something so phenomenally that you would live up to those expectations and you've overcome obstacles or competition. You see, those are all ways to get your name written down in history as having a good track, words, track record, so much so that you could be like the psalmist and say, you know what, I've, I've done everything right. I've stayed on track. However, I think one of the most important things is that this is also public, right? This is really public. And the psalmist is now saying, look at my life. You can see the way I've dealt with people. And, and this, this individual was not perfect. I'm going to guess that you're not either because I know that I'm not. And still, he said, I've done everything possible to obey your laws and to care for others the way that it's outlined in Scripture. And right here, I, I also want to recognize, you know, how, how is it possible? How are we supposed to not be triggered by these types of expectations? Right? If I'm supposed to be living up to something like that, how am I not going to be triggered? Right? If I have all these, if these boundaries that I have to run by and I have these laws and these precepts and these commands that I have to follow and obey, how, how do I not uh, get my type A expectations um, going through the roof? Well, I, I want to draw your attention to a, a verse in the book of John. Uh, he, Jesus is talking about him being the bread of life, himself being the bread of life. And these people around him, he, he's saying this life, this is eternal life that he's offering. And they say, okay, well, what must we do to, to do the works that God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So bottom line, for us to be able to look back on our track record and know that we've done everything we, we can is, is belief. And, and that's not a cop-out. And that's not, um, not taking our faith seriously. I actually think that's taking our faith more seriously than trying to take it into our own hands and, and check a bunch of boxes to make sure that we're approved of by God. You see, here's the thing. His, his confession to you and to me is that he's done all the heavy lifting and that you have an opportunity, you and I have an opportunity to simply believe. And so at the end of the day, you know, as we look back from then to now at the end of the day, did you say yes to God as many times as you could have? And even if the answer is no, what do we start with? Our God is a God of grace, right? And so I want to make every day, and I think we have an opportunity to make every day, we wake up in the morning and say, God, I want to say yes to you as many times as possible today. And at night, the way we evaluate on uh, whether or not we stayed on track is, is asking the same question. Did I, did I do what I saw my God doing? Did I say yes to him? It takes a lot of the, the pressure off of us type A folks or those of us who think um, our, our faith and our relationship with Jesus is a bunch of checkboxes. So we continue. One of the other ways that we see transformation uh, is internal delight. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. So we've gone from Okay, I'm comparing myself to others. That's something that we can understand. I'm, I'm also giving you an opportunity to look at my track record. But here's the internal reality too. Here's what I can tell you. It's that I think that, that God is sweeter than honey. Um, I, I have done a Daniel fast before. I don't know if you know what that is, but a Daniel fast, essentially you're a vegan. But in addition to that, it's like fruit, veggies, nuts and seeds, uh, no sugars, no caffeine, none of it. And I have to tell you that a banana never tasted so sweet, right? Like I never enjoyed fruit so much. And the reality is, is that honey in this instance, this instance is, is the sweetest thing that this individual can think of. It's, it's sweeter than honey in my mouth. I delight in this. I crave it. I enjoy it. It. And here's the thing, I think this is a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think time spent in the Word creates a greater love for the Word. 
Because time spent in the Word is time spent in the presence of God, and time spent in the presence of God creates a greater desire for the presence of God. I mean, that's exactly what Psalm 37, 4 tells us. It says, uh, I know that you probably know this if, if you are a follower of Jesus. I had someone this week tell me, well, doesn't God give you the desires of your heart? Uh, yes, that's a promise in Scripture, but you have to read the whole sentence. Psalm 37 says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Take delight in the Lord. If you're delighting in the Lord, what's the desire of your heart? It's the Lord. Because that's where you find all your delight. And so as we, as we look at the Word, what we're going to see and we spend time with the Word, if we take an opportunity to think back on our life spent in the Word, uh, may, may we see this unavoidable transformation that we see positive external comparisons, we see obvious fruit, and, and that we can truly say with our whole being that, that we have an internal delight now. And, and what we see at the very end of that, that um, place in Scripture 104, it says, Therefore I hate every wrong path. It, it takes us into the next section, so, and talking about from now until then, where I am now and where I'm headed. Uh, this this individual was not naive enough to think that, that they had arrived, right? That, that I've done all this, I've done a good job, now I'm going to coast through the rest of my life. They look forward, and so he talks about, I hate every wrong path, I'm not going to go down those. And that's actually the first place in this psalm that, that hate is introduced into the equation. You see, his heart is becoming more and more like God's, where he loves the things, things God loves, and he hates the things God hates those things which separate people from him or make them suffer. God does not delight in those things, and yet they are still our reality. But what we see is we move from now until then, as the psalmist outlines it. One, we're going to see forward momentum. We're going to see transformation. We're going to have forward momentum. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. You know, it's this idea. I'm going to continue to move forward. I will not stay dormant. I will not get dormant here. Uh, uh, in the past couple of weeks, uh, Pastor Todd has talked about the difference between comfort and comfortable. Comfort is a place from which to, to feel safe and move forward. Comfortable is a place in which to feel safe and stay stagnant. And, and the psalmist is saying, no, I'm not going to do that. And one of the things that I heard about this verse a long time ago, when I first became a follower of Jesus, talking about your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Uh, you probably heard that once or twice before. And if you haven't, man, the first thing I thought of was like high beam floodlights, right? God is going to illuminate everything before me. And I'm going to be able to see all the dangers and the snares. If there's a cliff over here or if there's danger over there, if that's the wrong path in that direction. But that's not what it says. It says that God's word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. He's giving us light for where I'm standing right now. Not for a mile ahead, not for a hundred yards ahead, not even a foot ahead, just right where I am. And we can trust in the Lord that he will always illuminate our path as we walk through light, life with him, with his light and with his presence. And, and what's beautiful too here is that we see okay, I'm going to commit to, to letting that be enough for me. Because after that, he says, I've taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. An oath, it's a commitment. It's a covenant. It's, I'm saying, I'm going to follow hard after you. It's an opportunity for us to say yes to him. And what's beautiful is that, um, man, the best intentions are, are often laid to waste, at least in my life. But tomorrow's a new day. And the scriptures tell us that God's mercies are new every single morning. And so you and I get to wake up with a blank slate and saying, okay, God, I'm, I want to say yes to you as many times as I can today. So we see that we're going to have forward momentum, but then we also see that we're going to have certain suffering. That's part of our transformation process. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. A certain time in my life, I had to discover 
that there was a, a separation between two truths. And that was life is really hard and can really fill, be filled with trials and, and suffering and that God is good. And I think we can, uh, especially that first one, I think we can agree with if, if we've been on the earth long enough, that, that life is filled with suffering and we are going to suffer in our future. And Todd, Pastor Todd spoke on that last week. I encourage you, if you did not listen to that, it's from affliction to devotion. It's incredible. And I really encourage you to spend some time there. But what I want to focus on uh, is the fact that in the midst of suffering, the, the meditation on the word has changed the psalmist's attitude towards his suffering. You see, it's not just that there's going to be certain suffering, but the certain suffering will be prompting sincere worship. It'll be prompting sincere worship. Because listen, he starts, I have suffered much, preserved my life according to your word. And then he's sandwiched in between more conversation about suffering. He says, accept Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. To be able to worship God in the midst of trial is, is one of the most beautiful things that I think we can witness in, in another follower of Jesus. It, is, it results in some of the most inspiring stories, um, uplifting moments, lasting legacies. But it seems impossible for us, doesn't it? I'm going to be really transparent with you. It's been a while since I've, I've really had to wrestle with anxiety and uh this past week from wednesday to friday i was in the throes of it um, losing sleep and uh stomach aches and mind racing and and couldn't focus and it was absolutely overwhelming and um I, the only time that i felt any margin of peace the only time and i'm not saying i had a bunch of peace before I, I didn't have a bunch of peace after <laughs> after I did this. I, I was on auto uh, cycle again all over the place. But the only time I had peace was when I cracked open the scriptures. And I, I am in the book of John right now. And I read the story of God raising Lazarus from the dead and, and his intimate, beautiful, sweet interactions with Martha and Mary, Lazarus' sisters. And... There wasn't anything profound that I thought of that I need to write down in my journal or felt like I, I got a word from God for you. Literally, the only thing I got was just a little bit of margin in which I was able to say, thank you, God. And, and I know this is truly uh, tiny compared to, to suffering that I know some of you have gone through. But the thing is, in the midst of the storm... When, when you are crying your eyes out in your car or at your house or with someone else, and maybe you've experienced this before, uh, the Word of God or in, in the form of the Word, um, in the form of listening to the Bible, in the form of singing worship songs. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced that little bit of margin that it gives you, that margin of peace in which to praise God. And I think... Um, an author who's absolutely been transforming my life in the midst of this quarantine is Brennan Manning. And I'm reading his book, Abba's Child, for the second time right now um, in the past two months. I highly encourage you to read it. But something he says here uh, really changes our perspective when it comes to suffering and the hardships of life. He says this, It takes a, prof a profound conversion to accept that God is relentlessly tender and compassionate towards us just as we are not in spite of our sins and faults that would be uh, that would not be total acceptance but with them though god does not condone or sanction evil he does not withhold his love because there is evil in us he just doesn't he doesn't take it away he doesn't give more when we're perfect and so in the middle of me indulging my anxiety, and that's a very real chemical, biological thing, but there were also certainly moments where I really didn't take it to the Lord and, and I just let my mind go on loop. And even in those moments, I know, and I know even in those moments for you, you can know that God tenderly 
intimately, compassionately loves you. And that's exactly what you're going to read in this book. And it's why the word transforms us so that we might have hope in the midst of suffering. And that's exactly where the psalmist ends. He ends with confident hope. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. You know, I've heard it said that, that um, we really ought to spend time practicing worship now uh, because if when we get to heaven, we didn't spend our lifetime worshiping Jesus. It's going to be a, a little awkward for us because that's what we're going to be spending eternity doing is, is living in the presence of Jesus and, and worshiping him. And one of the things that, that the psalmist claims is that if, if he makes his statutes, his heritage forever, they are going to be the joy of his heart. And so it takes a desire to do it now. It takes a desire from, uh, to move from then to now and from now until eternity. And it's really important for us to take his word at its word and let, us, let it transform us so that we might have a confident hope in our Lord and Savior, Jesus, that we might know that we will forever be changed in his presence in his word. So let's pray together as we close tonight. Almighty God, we, uh, we are so incredibly thankful for your word. We are so profoundly grateful for the opportunity to spend time in your presence. And I pray that you would do a supernatural work in us. Right? In us ordinary people, would you do extraordinary works of supernatural change in our hearts, in our minds? And would that come by this word? And wherever we are, whether we're coming at it reluctantly, whether we're coming at it um, with a little bit of hope, whether we are finding it to be our greatest delight, would you take us from where we are, from where we were then, to where we are now, from where we are now, into an eternity with you? spent worshiping and delighting in you. I pray that every single one of us would get a glimpse of heaven in that way during our time on this earth, that we would delight in you all the days of our life. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower. Let it
And so as we finish our time together today, I want to thank you so much for being a part of our Legacy Online family. And I want to let you know, especially if you're visiting with us, if you're, if you're new, newer to our online services, we would love to connect with you. Let us know that you're here. If you have a prayer request, if you'd like to get involved some way at Legacy Church, we'd love to connect and hear from you. And the simplest way to do that is to go to our website, LegacySD.org slash connect. Fill out the simple form. We will reach back with you and get you connected into so many different ways and areas that Legacy has to offer. One of the things also about our website, you can see all the other things that are going on. One of those things is our Legacy family continues to be so generous and faithful in their giving. You can use, there's a simple button to click on right there. You can connect through the front page of the website. It'll also let you know about groups that we have. We have a number of online groups and some of those have taken a little break for the summer and some of those have continued. And we have some new groups that are opening up uh, via Zoom. So you can do that. You can see all the information there on the website as well as uh, to be reminded of what's happening. We've been able to relaunch our Celebrate Recovery Ministry at our Tierra Santa campus on Wednesday nights. They meet at 6.30. It's a time to gather. It's a secure and safe environment that you can come and do life together with other people that might be struggling with some type of hurt, habit, hang up. Maybe you're struggling with some type of addiction or some other mental thing going on. We would love to have you be a part of our Celebrate Recovery ministry. It's a Jesus-centered, Jesus-focused way to recover from the different things that might be hanging you up. And then we also want a quick reminder, if you got our email this week, you may have seen, a, we want to love our Parkway family. There's an opportunity to get together and, and help them out with some back to school supplies that some teachers and even some of the kids have. So uh, all the information there is on our website as well. Thank you so much for being with us today. We pray a continued blessing over you, not only today, but this week. Thanks for being a part of our Legacy Church family. We love you. Thanks for being here. Have a great week and God bless.